Book Two, Part Two of Herodotus Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Histories, Volume One, by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by A. D. Godley. Book Two, Part Two, Paragraphs Twenty Four through Forty One. If after having condemned the opinions proposed, I must indicate what I myself think about these obscure matters. I shall say why I think the Nile floods in the summer. During the winter, the sun is driven by storms from his customary course and passes over the inland parts of Libya. For the briefest demonstration, everything has been said. For whatever country this god is nearest or over, it is likely that the land is very thirsty for water and that the local rivers are dried up. A lengthier demonstration goes as follows. In his passage over the inland parts of Libya, the sun does this. As the air is always clear in that region, the land warm and the winds cool, the sun does its passage exactly as it would do in the summer, passing through the middle of the heaven. It draws the water to itself, and having done so, expels it away to the inland regions, and the winds catch it and scatter it and dissolve it, and, as is to be expected, those that blow from that country, the south and the southwest, are the most rainy of all winds. Yet I think that the sun never lets go of all the water that it draws up from the Nile yearly, but keeps some back near itself. Then, as the winter becomes milder, the sun returns to the middle of the heaven, and after that draws from all rivers alike. Meanwhile the other rivers are swollen to high flood by the quantity of water that falls into them, from the sun, because the country is rained on and cut into gullies, but in the summer they are low, lacking the rain and being drawn up too by the sun. But the Nile, being fed by no rain, and being the only river drawn up by the sun in winter, at this time falls far short of that height that it had in summer, which is but natural, for in summer all other waters too, and not it alone, are attracted to the sun, but in winter it alone is afflicted. I am convinced, therefore, that the sun is the cause of this phenomena. The dryness of the air in these parts is also caused by the sun, in my opinion, because it burns its way through it. Hence, it is always summer in the inland part of Libya. But were the stations of the seasons changed, so that the south wind and the summer had their station where the north wind and the winter are now set, and the north wind was where the south wind is now, if this were so, the sun, when driven from mid-heaven by the winter, and the north wind, would pass over the inland parts of Europe, as it now passes over Libya, and I think that in its passage over all Europe it would have the same effect on the Ister, as it now does on the Nile. And as to why no breeze blows from the river, this is my opinion. It is not natural that any breeze blow from very hot places. Breezes always come from that which is very cool. Let this be, then, as it is, and as it was in the beginning. But as to the sources of the Nile, no one that conversed with me, Egyptian, Libyan, or Greek, professed to know them, except the recorder of the sacred treasures of Athena in the Egyptian city of Sais. I thought he was joking when he said he had exact knowledge, but this was his story. Between the city of Syene in the Thebaid and Elephantine, there are two hills with sharp peaks, one called Crophi, the other Mophi. The springs of the Nile, which are bottomless, rise between these hills. Half the water flows north towards Egypt, the other half south towards Ethiopia. He said that Semetis, king of Egypt, had put this to the test whether the springs are bottomless, for he had a rope of many thousand fathoms length woven, and let down into the spring, but he could not reach to the bottom. This recorder, then, if he spoke the truth, showed, I think, that there are strong eddies and an upward flow of water such that, with the stream rushing against the hills, the sounding line, when let down, cannot reach bottom. I was unable to learn anything from anyone else, but this much further I did learn by the most extensive investigation that I could make, going as far as the city of Elephantine to look myself, and beyond that by question and hearsay. Beyond Elephantine, as one travels inland, the land rises. Here one must pass with the boat roped on both sides, as men harness an ox, and if the rope breaks, the boat will be carried away by the strength of the current. This part of the river is a four days' journey by boat, and the Nile here is twisty, just as the meander. 
a distance of twelve sconi must be passed in the foregoing manner. After that, you come to a level plain, where there is an island in the Nile, called Tacompso. The country above Elephantine now begins to be inhabited by Ethiopians. Half the people of the island are Ethiopians, and half Egyptians. Near the island is a great lake, on whose shores live nomadic Ethiopians. After crossing this, you come to the stream of the Nile, which empties into this lake. Then you disembark, and journey along the river bank for forty days, for there are sharp projecting rocks in the Nile, and many reefs, through which no boat can pass. Having traversed this part in forty days, as I have said, you take boat again, and so travel for twelve days, until you come to a great city called Meroe, which is said to be the capital of all Ethiopia. The people of the place worship no other gods but Zeus and Dionysus. These they greatly honor, and they have a place of divination sacred to Zeus. They send out armies wherever this god, through his oracle, commands them. From this city you make a journey by water equal in distance to that by which you came from Elephantine to the capital city of Ethiopia, and you come to the land of the deserters. These deserters are called Asmak, which translates in Greek as those who stand at the left hand of the king. These once revolted and joined themselves to the Ethiopians, 240,000 Egyptians of fighting age. The reason was as follows. In the reign of Semeticus, there were watch posts at Elephantine facing Ethiopia, at Daphne of Pelusium facing Arabia and Assyria, and at Maria facing Libya. And still, in my time, the Persians hold those posts as they were held in the days of Semeticus. There are Persian guards at Elephantine and at Daphne. Now the Egyptians have been on guard for three years, and no one came to relieve them. So, organizing and making common cause, they revolted from Semeticus and went to Ethiopia. Semeticus heard of it and pursued them, and when he overtook them, he asked them in a long speech not to desert their children and wives and the gods of their fathers. Then one of them, the story goes, pointed to his genitals and said that wherever that was, they would have wives and children. So they came to Ethiopia and gave themselves up to the king of the country, who, to make them a gift in return, told them to dispossess certain Ethiopians with whom he was feuding and occupy their land. These Ethiopians then learned Egyptian customs and had become milder mannered by intermixture with the Egyptians. To a distance of four months' travel, by land and water, then, there is the knowledge of the Nile, besides the part of that which is in Egypt. So many months, as reckoning shows, are found to be spent by one going from Elephantine to the country of the deserters. The river flows from the west, and the sun setting. Beyond this, no one has clear information to declare, for all that country is desolate because of the heat. I have heard this from some men of Cyrene, who told me that they had gone to the oracle of Amman, and conversed there with Etyrchus, king of the Ammonians, and that from other subjects the conversation turned to the Nile, how no one knows the source of it. Then Etyrchus told them that once he had been visited by some Nesamonians. These are a Libyan people, inhabiting the country of the Syrtis, and a little way to the east of the Syrtis. When these Nasimonians were asked on their arrival if they brought any news concerning the Libyan desert, they told Etyrchus that some sons of their leading men, proud and violent youths, when they came to manhood, besides planning other wild adventures, had chosen by lot five of their company to visit the deserts of Libya, and see whether they could see farther than those who had seen the farthest. It must be known that the whole northern seacoast of Libya, from Egypt as far is the promontory of Soliasis, which is the end of Libya, is inhabited throughout its length by Libyans, many tribes of them, except the part held by Greeks and Phoenicians. The region of Libya, that is above the sea, and the inhabitants of the coast, are infested by wild beasts, and farther inland than the wild beast country, everything is sand, waterless and desolate. When the young men left their companions, being well supplied with water and provisions, they journeyed first through the inhabited country, and after passing this came to the region of wild beasts. After this they traveled over the desert towards the west, and crossed a wide sandy region, until after many days they saw trees growing in a plain. 
when they came to these and were picking the fruit of the trees they were met by little men of less than common stature who took them and led them away the nasimonians did not know these men's language nor did the escort know the language of the nasimonians the men led them across great marshes after crossing which they came to a city where all the people were of a stature like that of the guides and black a great river ran past this city from the west towards the rising sun crocodiles could be seen in it this is enough of the story told by etyrcus the ammonian except that he said that the nasimonians returned as the men of cyrene told me and that the people to whose country they came were all wizards as to the river which ran past the city etyrcus guessed it to be the nile and reason proves as much for the nile flows from libya right through the middle of it and as i guess reasoning about things unknown from visible signs it rises proportionally as far away as does the ister for the ister flows from the land of the celts and the city of pyrene through the very middle of europe now the celts live beyond the pillar of hercules being the neighbors of the canisi who are the westernmost of all people inhabiting europe the ister then flows clean across europe and ends its course in the euxine sea at istria which is inhabited by milesian colonists the ister since it flows through inhabited country is known from many reports but no one can speak of the source of the nile for libya through which it runs is uninhabited and desert regarding its course i have related everything i could learn by inquiry and it issues into egypt now egypt lies about opposite to the mountainous region of cilicia from there it is a straight five days journey for an unencumbered man to sinope on the euxine and sinope lies opposite the place where the ister falls into the sea thus i suppose the course of the nile in its passage through libya to be like the course of the ister it is sufficient to say this much concerning the nile but concerning egypt i am going to speak at length because it has the most wonders and everywhere presents works beyond description therefore i shall say the more concerning egypt just as the Egyptians have a climate peculiar to themselves, and their river is different in its nature from all other rivers, so too have they instituted customs and laws contrary for the most part to those of the rest of mankind. Among them the women buy and sell, the men stay at home and weave, and whereas in weaving all others push the woof upwards, the Egyptians push it downwards. Men carry burdens on their heads, women on their shoulders, Women pass water standing, men sitting. They ease their bowels indoors and eat out of doors in the streets, explaining that things unseemly but necessary should be done in private, things not unseemly should be done openly. No woman is dedicated to the service of any god or goddess. Men are dedicated to all deities, male or female. Sons are not compelled against their will to support their parents, but daughters must do so though they be unwilling. Everywhere else the priests of the gods wear their hair long. In Egypt they are shaven. For all other men, the rule in mourning for the dead is that those most nearly concerned have their head shaven. Egyptians are shaven at other times, but after a death they let their hair and beard grow. The Egyptians are the only people who keep their animals with them in the house, whereas all others live on wheat and barley. It is the greatest disgrace for the Egyptian to live so. They make food from a coarse grain which they call spelt. They knead dough with their feet and gather mud and dung with their hands. The Egyptians, and those who have learned it from them, are the only people who practice circumcision. Every man has two garments, every woman only one. The rings and sheets of sails are made fast outside the boat elsewhere, but inside it in Egypt. The Greeks write and calculate from left to right. The Egyptians do the opposite. Yet they say that their way of writing is towards the right, the Greek way towards the left. They employ two kinds of writing. One is called sacred, the other demotic. They are religious beyond measure, more than any other people, and the following are among their customs. They drink from cups of bronze, which are always clean out daily. This is not done by some, but by all. They are especially careful always to wear newly washed linen, they practice circumcision for cleanliness' sake, for they would rather be clean than more becoming. Their priests shave their whole body every other day, 
so that no lice or anything else foul may infest them as they attend upon the gods. The priests wear a single linen garment and sandals of papyrus. They have no other kind of clothing or footwear. Twice a day and twice every night they wash in cold water. Their religious observances are, one may say, innumerable. But they also receive many benefits, for they do not consume or spend anything of their own. Sacred food is cooked for them. Beef and goose are brought in, great abundance, to each man every day, and the wine of grapes is given to them, too. They may not eat fish. The Egyptians sow no beans in their country. If any grow, they will not eat them, either raw or cooked. The priests cannot endure even to see them, considering beans an unclean kind of legume. Many, not only one, are dedicated to the service of each god. One of these is the high priests, and when a high priest dies, his son succeeds him to his office. They believe that bulls belong to Epaphus, and for this reason scrutinize them as follows. If they see even one black hair on them, the bull is considered impure. One of the priests, appointed to the task, examines the beast, making it stand and lie, and drawing out its tongue, to determine whether it is clean of the stated signs, which I shall indicate hereafter. He looks also to the hairs of the tail, to see if they grow naturally. If it is clean in all these respects, the priest marks it by wrapping papyrus around the horns, then smears it with sealing earth and stamps it with his ring. After this they lead the bull away, but the penalty is death for sacrificing a bull that the priest has not marked. Such is the manner of approving the beast. I will now describe how it is sacrificed. After leading the marked beast to the altar where they will sacrifice it, they kindle a fire, then pour wine on the altar, over the victim, and call upon the god. Then they cut its throat, and having done so, sever the head from the body. They flay the carcass of the victim. They invoke many curses on its head, which they carry away. Where there is a market, and Greek traders in it, the head is taken to the market and sold. Where there are no Greeks, they throw it into the river. The imprecation which they utter over the heads is that whatever ill threatens those who sacrifice, or the whole of Egypt, fall upon that head. In respect of the heads of sacrificed beasts and the libation of wine, the practice of all Egyptians is the same in all sacrifices, and from this ordinance no Egyptian will taste the head of anything that had life. But in regard to the disemboweling and burning of the victims, there is a different way for each sacrifice. I shall now, however, speak of that goddess whom they consider the greatest, and in whose honor they keep the highest festival. After praying in the foregoing way, they take the whole stomach out of the flayed bull, leaving the entrails and the fat in the carcass, and cut off the legs and the end of the loin, the shoulders and the neck. Having done this, they fill what remains of the carcass with pure bread, honey, raisins, figs, frankincense, myrrh, and other kinds of incense, and then burn it, pouring a lot of oil on it. They fast before the sacrifice, and while it is burning, they make all lamentation, and when their lamentation is over, they set out a meal of what is left of the victim. All Egyptians sacrifice unblemished bulls and bull calves. They may not sacrifice cows. These are sacred to Isis. For the images of Isis are in woman's form, horned like a cow, exactly as the Greeks picture Io. And the cows are held by far the most sacred of all beasts of the herd of all Egyptians alike. For this reason, no Egyptian man or woman will kiss a Greek man, or use a knife, or a spit, or a cauldron belonging to a Greek, or taste the flesh of an unblemished bull that has been cut with a Greek knife. Cattle that die are dealt with in the following way. Cows are cast into the river. Bulls are buried by each city in its suburbs, with one or two horns uncovered for a sign. Then, when the carcass is decomposed and the time appointed is at hand, a boat comes to each city from the island called Prosopitus, an island in the delta nine scoiny in circumference. There are many other towns on Prosopitus. The one from which the boats come to gather the bones of the bulls is called Artabecus. A temple of Aphrodite stands in it of great sanctity. From this town many go out, some to one town and some to another, to dig up the bones which they then carry away, and all bury in one place. As they bury the cattle, so they do all other beasts at death. Such is their ordinance respecting these also, for they too may not be killed. 
end of book two, part two.